You know what's fascinating? Red light and near red light therapy both improves and worsens mitochondrial function. Bet you didn't expect that answer out of the gate. I'll explain why in a bit because I analyzed five studies looking into if a red light therapy actually affects mitochondria or not. I also called my dad up for this investigation because this topic required a bit of uh, physics understanding and he earned his uh, PhD in physics. And his dissertation was in lasers. Pew pew. I mean, I've been extremely dissatisfied by the explanations that people have offered on social media as to exactly how red light therapy affects mitochondria. All I ever hear is, uh, it improves mitochondrial function or it increases cellular energy. But how exactly? Anyway, we'll, we'll get into it. For us to understand anything on what I'm about to show you, it's important for you to understand how mitochondria function, at, at least a little. Here's a mitochondria, and we can see that it has two membranes that separate the inside of the mitochondria from the inside of the cell called the cytosol, the innermost membrane. The inner membrane is inundated with different functional proteins, and one group of proteins is called the electron transport chain made up of, depending on who you ask, five complex proteins. They have uh, sciencey names given to them at birth by their mitochondria parents like NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase, but let's go with their simpler names. Complex one, two, three, four, and five. Continuing the simple theme, these first four complexes exchange something called electrons in such a way that allows complex Five to generate cellular energy, known as ATP. And yes, this is why mitochondria are considered the powerhouse of the cell. Anyway, that's a bit of background, which is important, because we're going to have to fill in some details later and complexify it up. In one study, researchers took a photobiomodulation, the fancy term for light therapy, to muscle cells and brain cells of rats and measured the activity of some of these mitochondrial complexes. Now you see why I introduced you to them. They didn't like you very much, but let's move on to the data. Here, we're looking at muscle cells exposed to the light after five minutes and after 60 minutes. On the left, we have complex one of the mitochondrion. In the middle is complex two, and the right is complex four. The controls are cells that are not exposed to the photobiomodulation, and the 10, 30, and 60 are different intensities of light in joules. What you'll notice is that the effects are a little all over the place, with no effect on complex 2 after 5 minutes, and a loss of an effect in complex 1 after 60 minutes, and that was there after 5 minutes. I mean, it's pretty fascinating how all over the place this all is. These results were mostly repeated in brain cells as well. Now, this might be a simple experiment because we're applying the light directly to the cells, but what it also removes is many confounding factors. We also don't need to rely on just that study because there are others like this one that took samples from people undergoing surgery after red light therapy. And interestingly, the researchers also showed a number of mitochondrial markers that were different although they were more focused on uh, morphology proteins, meaning proteins that influence the size and shape of mitochondria. I don't find this evidence provided all that convincing of anything, except that these uh, mitochondrial proteins were changed in concentration from the exposure to red light therapy. Regardless, we're building evidence that red light therapy does affect mitochondria. This particular study was fascinating because this is the one that showed near red light therapy might be detrimental to mitochondrial function. As one example, here the researchers have isolated cow liver mitochondria and irradiated them and then measured the amount of ATP generated by complex 5. It's the fancy name is ATP synthase. As you'll see, relative to the control zero there, the therapy dramatically reduced mitochondrial ATP generation when applied at low power, yet normalized at moderate power, and then increased at higher power. If you want a more granular look across the power ranges, here you go. Again, low power reduced ATP generation, higher power increased the production, 
but then even higher drops ATP synthesis back down. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's just so conditional, you know? All right, I'll mention what that all means in a bit, but I also wanted to see if this could be confirmed uh, in vivo, meaning in a living creature. I actually didn't watch humans for this, but rather a naive subject like mice. The previous research that we've gone over is in tissue samples, cells, and isolated mitochondria, all very informative. But it's nice to check in living tissue as well as potentially look at some functional outcomes. The model used by the researchers of this study doesn't matter all too much, but if you're curious, they used a neurocognitive disorder model of mice. So mice with cognitive deficits and applied near infrared therapy to the mice and measured functional outcomes. Here, we're looking at a measure of memory and thinking ability. The mice were trained on where a specific hole was and then when tasked with finding the hole again over multiple attempts over days, the time it took to find the hole acted as the measure. So the higher the line, the worse the result. The black line is the mice without cognitive deficit. The light tan line is the healthy mice given the infrared therapy. The blue line is those mice with the cognitive deficits, and the orange is the mice with the cognitive deficits given near infrared therapy. First, it's obvious the mice with cognitive deficiency struggled, no matter how many times they were exposed. However, the striking result was the effect near infrared therapy had. I mean, look at that improvement. As a matter of fact, here's the top down view. The green dot is where they started, and the red dot is the target hole. I don't even need to identify the conditions because you can clearly see that the cognitively impaired mice moved around a lot trying to find it. Yet, sure enough, ATP levels were also recovered with infrared therapy, as seen in red compared to the blue. So across multiple studies, these photobiomodulation therapies seem to improve mitochondrial function, except there's still a great mystery. By the way, there's another study that I have a big issue with, but it does offer some really interesting results on blood sugar regulation in humans from a photobiomodulation therapy. I'll be covering that one for the Physionic Insiders. If you aren't already a member, then join using the link in the description. But back to the mystery. This mystery comes down to how does this work? It bugs me to just leave it so open-ended and just say that it improves mitochondrial function. Great. How? As I mentioned, I spoke to my dad, who also has his PhD, but in physics, and has done extensive work with lasers. Pew, pew. I described some of the proposed mechanisms like those outlined in this review, and we discussed on a few possibilities that make sense. I hope that you have your uh, seatbelt on in the magic school bus because we're about to discuss some heavy details on how mitochondria function. You already know that mitochondria have that inner and outer membrane and that the inner membrane contains these protein complexes that make up the electron transport chain. You should also know that there's a gradient between the exterior of the mitochondrion and the interior of the mitochondrion. The interior is much more negative in charge. So when your mitochondria produce cellular energy producing those ATP molecules, the way that they do that is by allowing positively charged protons to spin complex five, also known as the ATP synthase. In doing so, those protons flow into the intersection of the mitochondrion. And since they're positively charged, they reduce the membrane potential. In other words, the more positive exterior of the mitochondrion and the interior become more similar. So they're both positive. This is problematic because if the two sides are the same, there is no drive for the protons to continue to flow across complex five. And therefore you stop producing ATP for cellular energy. Think of it like a water mill that has no more water turning the wheel. No more mitochondria powerhouse of the cell. Fortunately, the other complexes of the electron transport chain pump protons back out of the internal section back out, thereby maintaining the membrane potential more negative inside. 
it's like a futile cycle of pumping protons out, then allowing them back in through the complex five. But the end result is that you keep producing ATP. Okay, where does red light and near red light come in? There are many mechanisms that have been outlined, some speculative. However, it seems that red light interacts with the complexes of the electron transport chain and can energize them, increasing their activity. So more proton pumping, more ATP generation, and so on. In addition, red light can interact with complex four, which is believed to act as a photoreceptor and can accept more electrons that then allows more protons to be pumped out of the mitochondria, thereby increasing the membrane potential. Remember, greater negativity inside. Also, there is an interaction with oxygen at complex four. And interestingly, other molecules can block that interaction of oxygen with complex four, like nitric oxide. This nitric oxide is bound to the heme groups that make up part of complex four and red light can dislodge these nitric oxide molecules, allowing oxygen to interact anew. This further aids in the maintenance of the membrane potential and the generation of ATP. It's also believed that red light therapy and the like can affect mitochondrial retrograde signaling. Since that's just so obvious, I just won't even bother explaining it, right? I kid, of course. It's basically that because there are these changes in ATP concentration, as well as other molecules like calcium, reactive oxygen species, and so on, this has a trickle-down effect on other signaling molecules that could enter the nucleus of the cell, where genes are housed and change the gene expression. There's a lot more to it than that, but at least this offers some explanation beyond uh, light do good mitochondria which is what I feel social media devolves to, and we just accept it as sufficient explanation. Well, not here. And if you're interested in more on my work on red light therapy, just hop on over to this video of mine. It shines a light on the topic. Mm, good one, Nick. <laughs>